The next item of business is a debate on Motion 8171 in the name of Christina McKelvey on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee on prejudice-based bullying and harassment of children and young people in schools and review of personal and social education. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Alex Cole Hamilton to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I remind the Chamber that I am the past convener of Together, the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. It's a privilege for me as Vice Convener to open this debate today on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee on our report into prejudice-based bullying and harassment of children and young people in schools. I must start by offering the apologies of the convener, Christina McKelvey, who cannot be here today for personal reasons. I also want to thank James Jornan and the members of his committee for agreeing to make this a joint debate on their recommendations around personal and social education, which, as we will hear, is vital if we are to help children understand what a healthy relationships and respect both look like. The committees liaise closely during their work, and it's an excellent example of how our parliamentary system can work to uphold the rights of young people in Scotland when we work together. Presiding officer, this debate is timely, as it takes place during National Anti-Bullying Week. It is also set, of course, against the backdrop of recent revelations of bullying and sexual harassment in public life. Those revelations are uncomfortable, but they are important. They offer us the opportunity to make this moment a turning point in the life of our country, if only we have the courage to grasp it and the commitment. Last month, when speaking about those revelations, the Deputy First Minister said that it is the conduct and behaviour of men that needs to change if we are to end sexual harassment. I agree with that entirely. The painful truth, however, is that we are only now reaching a critical mass of public debate around these issues because of the recent exposure in the high-profile worlds of entertainment and of politics. If we are to address this toxic culture, then we must see this problem in its entirety. And as our inquiry shows, prejudice, bullying, sexual harassment are commonplace in our education system. It would be dangerously naive of us to think that our behavior as adults in society is somehow unconnected to the learning environment in which we first began to socialize with others. Prejudice, <coughs> bullying, harassment, and the trauma that can result from them possess an enormous risk to the health and well-being of Scotland's young people. This is why the aim of the committee's inquiry was to put the voice of children at the center of public debate on these problems. And we have heard from many, many brave young people who told us of their experiences at school and the picture they painted to us was a very harrowing one. And like all pupils, their hopes were for a school experience that would help them to grow to their full potential, both academically and socially. But for all too many, the reality is that school life is an experience to be endured and from which significant trauma can result. They fight a daily battle in classrooms, in corridors, playing fields and online. Their primary goal is merely to survive their education, emotionally and psychologically, and then to come to terms with the trauma that they have been left with. Now, our inquiry heard stories of racism, sexism, disability prejudice, religious and ethnic intolerance, homophobic bullying, hate speech, and physical and sexual harassment. Shockingly, we heard of many cases where, which included serious criminal offenses, such as hate crime, assault, and rape, taking place in the school environment. We were concerned to hear that many professionals in the education sector seem unequipped to the challenge before them. But most troubling of all were the examples where some teachers condoned or incited such behavior among students or even the cause of it themselves. We received evidence that 27% of LGBTI children in Scotland have attempted suicide because of bullying or homophobia. And the measure of the task ahead of us is great and laid out in the representations we received. One study showed that over half the requests made by disabled young people seeking additional support uh, identified bullying as a contributory factor to their needs. Another study found that more than half of all Muslim children in Edinburgh encountered Islamophobia in school, and uh, well, with one third of it directly experiencing it in their community. 
And Girl Guiding Scotland told us that 59% of their members aged 13 to 21 reported having experienced some form of sexual harassment in the school environment. All of this was reinforced by evidence we took from organisations like Rape Crisis Scotland, Children in Scotland, CRER, LGBT Youth Scotland and others. And it should sound an alarm bell to all of us. Presiding officer, protecting the rights of our children is central to their development. As such, we should adopt a rights-based approach in all aspects of our education system. That is why our report called for a fundamental shift in the way that we view this problem. Put simply, there is a, human rights, a children's human rights deficit in our midst. And we must meet that challenge head on and seek to build an adequate response to trauma recovery for those who already suffered because of it. And irrespective of the setting, be it council run, faith-based or independent schooling, it ultimately falls to the state to protect the rights of our children as they learn. We must recognize that the cost of failure is fast becoming a major public health and well-being problem. As such, we must work collaboratively to address this problem with the same energy and cross-party commitment as we would with cancer care or domestic violence. Failure to meet this growing challenge will be measured out in increased demands on the public purse. And we have already seen in the news that the UK government may face litigation for its failure to prevent peer-on-peer -peer abuse in schools in England. But the social cost of inaction is greater still in the loss of life chances, lower economic productivity, increased rates of depression, self-harm and suicide. All told, our report made 29 recommendations, and I'm pleased to say that the government responded positively to all of them. I thank them for that. We are grateful to the Deputy First Minister for agreeing to put on hold the update of the national anti-bullying strategy, Respect for All. This allowed us to undertake our work in a way that could influence that refresh of the strategy. We welcome, too, the government's commitment to keep the strategy up to date, refreshing it at least every five years. But we note the government silent on our call for the public and for public and the parliament to be involved in this process. And the committee is therefore anxious in this debate for the for Deputy First Minister to provide clarity on how the government will lead on driving forward change with the wider public and with parliament. We also welcome the government's support for our call to make the reporting of bullying and harassment mandatory across Scottish education and for all schools to have an actively inclusive culture. Yet our fear is that while many key players like Education Authority, the General Teaching Council, may see the need for change in their individual silos, some might fail to grasp the full sc size, scope and urgency of the problem now facing Scotland. This is why the committee believes that the full incorporation of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child into Scots law would help to focus minds on driving the cultural change we need to see in our society and give children access to justice when their rights are denied to them. We also welcome the Deputy First Minister's support for our call that all teachers receive training on how to deal with bullying and harassment and that children be taught about consent, healthy relationships and equalities from their early years and throughout their school lives. I'm sure that that sentiment will speak to the many contributions we shall hear from colleagues on the Education Committee this afternoon. In conclusion, presiding officer, the Equalities and Human Rights Committees will continue to hold to account all those responsible for protecting the rights of our children, will assess progress on our recommendations as part of our work in 2018. Can I finish by thanking all of my fellow committee members, our clerks, and those who gave evidence, and I move the uh, motion in the name of Christina McKelvey. Thank you. I call on James Dornan on behalf of the Education and Skills Committee. Up to eight minutes, please, Mr Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it's a great pleasure to speak in this joint debate today on behalf of the Education and Skills Committee. And can I start by thanking my fellow committee members and the clerks for all the good work that they've, they've done over the course of it. Listening to Alec Cole Hamilton's speech, there's a clear link between the inquiry of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee on prejudice-based bullying and my committee's work in personal and social education. Both committees found that there's a need to focus on the health and well-being aspects of our school and creating nurturing and safe environments for all our children and young people to learn. On that basis, we welcome the invitation from the Equalities Committee to hold a debate on this cross-cutting issue. And I very much hope that this collaboration and the clear cross-committee support for progress to be made in this area can have a real impact. I will briefly work through the approach my committee took, the evidence we heard and the broad conclusions we made. I'll leave it to other committee colleagues to explore particular recommendations in more detail. 
When my committee approached this work, we were keen to hear from as many young people, teachers and parents as we could, as well as hearing from experts and stakeholders. We invited responses in the form of short emails or directly on Facebook and Twitter on what PSE sessions should be about and how it should be delivered. The response was tremendous and much of the most powerful aspects of our inquiry were from the voices of young people themselves. We followed this up with a roundtable discussion on the 22nd of February this year and again we focused on hearing the views of young people and youth and children's organisations. It was, as Tavi Scott observed at the time, a brilliant panel. As you might expect from such an open consultation, there was a great many suggestions about the context of PSE. There were so many suggestions that I simply cannot cover them all in the time available. But to give you a flavour, many of the comments were about sex and relationships education, inclusivity, mental health, drug and alcohol misuse, citizenship and financial planning. Content, however, is only part of the story. Who chooses the content, who delivers the content and how it's delivered is also vital. We heard that PSE is most impactful and relevant if the curriculum is co-designed with the children and young people themselves, delivered by a range of people. The committee therefore recommended that all PSE programmes should have an element of co-design and should also feature external speakers. PSE should differ from class to class and school to school. However, there are some things that the committee firmly believes should be part of every school's PSE lessons. The committee identified mental health, equalities, sex and relationships education and substance abuse as the cornerstones of any PSE programme. The committee received many personal and sometimes heartbreaking accounts from young LGBTI people, their parents and their teachers about experiences of LGBTI people in school. One email said, at school we were only really told in passing that gay people exist, nothing about any other sexuality or gender identity. I therefore spent years thinking I was wrong for liking both men and women and for not experiencing sexual attraction. I thought I was broken. The last topic I want to address is good sex and relationship education, which has become even more important in the modern online world. In regard to children's access to the internet, Joanna Barrett from the NSPCC told the committee that by the age of 14, 90 odd percent of young people had seen pornography and about half of boys thought it was an accurate representation of sex. Girls were articulating that they were very worried that boys' impressions of and attitudes to women were negatively impacted by exposures to pornography. And some of the most powerful and disturbing evidence we heard was about consent. Claire Clark from Sexpression UK stated, consent is a massive issue, but it seems not to be coming across to young people. There is clearly a, a gap. We're letting people leave school with no information about consent, and we're having to cover it in universities. And I'll come back to this uh, later on in my contribution. The committee also heard about the importance of age-appropriate SRE starting at an early age, which was also highlighted in the Session 4 Health and Sport Committee, the 2013 report on teen pre teenage pregnancies. And the committee asked the Scottish Government about the progress it had made in this respect since 2013. Excuse me. One of our main findings is that PSE provision is patchy. The committee heard from teachers who are truly committed to PSE, Fantastic guidance teachers who put enormous thought, effort and passion into ensuring our young people are equipped to face and be part of the world. There are some places though where we could do a lot better. The committee believed that the first step was to recognise the inconsistent delivery of PSE and for the Scottish Government to undertake a review. We simply do not know enough about how PSE is taught in our schools and the reasons why it is better in some schools than others. The committee was pleased to be pre-empted by the Scottish Government, which announced such a review before we even had the chance to suggest it. <coughs> Joined up thinking eh? As part of this review, the committee wants the Scottish Government to examine whether schools PSE offer meets their duty to be health promoting and duties under the Equalities Act to meet the needs of those with protected characteristics, such as LGBTI young people. Recently, the committee asked those who had engaged with us during the inquiry to let us know for this debate what one point they would make in the chamber if they could. One response from Liz McNally simply states, the issue of LGBTI equality cannot be emphasised enough in the context of PSE, particularly with regard to the number of non-binary young people now self-identifying in the school community, to help their peers understand the importance of knowledge and respect and to help them challenge homophobic bullying safely. In terms of the next step, we need to wait for the conclusion of the review of PSE and indeed the working group looking at the recommendations of the Thai campaign. And I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary will provide an update on these pieces of work in his speech on summing up. Before I finish, I, I beg my fellow committee members for a little leeway to speak briefly as the member for Glasgow Kitakart. We spoke earlier on about the importance of knowledge around the meaning of consent. This is important in schools. 
not just for the well-being of the young people whilst they're at school, but to prepare them for when they leave to attend further and higher education institutions. Constituents of mine, Fiona and Germaine Druitt, lost her daughter in the most terrible circumstances imaginable when she took her own life in her first year of university last year after being bullied and abused by another student. With their permission, I'd like to let them use my voice so that they can speak to you today about the importance of PSE. Losing our beloved daughter Emily in such tragic circumstances left us questioning every aspect of her life. The never-ending what-ifs, why didn't we, if-onlys. But in our calmer and more rational states of mind, we understand all these questions have the same answer, him. Our question, why didn't we, often continues as, why didn't we know he was a danger? The misogynistic, cold-hearted and determined way he conducted himself was alien to Emily, and the outcome speaks for itself. How could a 20-year-old boy be so ignorant and lacking in human decency, empathy and compassion? Unfortunately, it seems parents can't be relied upon to have those all-important conversations with their children about healthy and respectful relationships. PSE is the perfect opportunity to tackle the many and complex issues young people in our fast-evolving society may face, but it has to be made relevant to our children. Consent, kindness, love, honesty, respect are values that can only be brought home by involving them in a thought-provoking discussion. We have to develop PSE in such a way that pupils fully engage with the subject. PSE shouldn't be just another lesson, but be a challenging experience where pupils are openly asked their opinions and encouraged to share experiences and feelings. You should also be educated in the role as bystanders. Early intervention and education can only help other girls avoid the horrific experiences our daughter had to endure. Presiding officer, there are no words I could possibly add that would more eloquently or powerfully highlight the importance of PSE, and I very much support the motion in the name of Christine McKelvey. Thank you. And I call John Swinney. Up to seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding officer, can I begin by thanking the Education Skills Committees and the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for their reports, which are the subject of debate today. There's a vast amount to cover in this debate, and I'll do my level best in the opening and closing speeches to cover as much ground as I possibly can do. This debate takes place uh, during Anti-Bullying Week, which provides us with the opportunity to send a clear and positive message that bullying of any kind is totally unacceptable, and that when it happens, we all have a responsibility to address it. We need to intervene early and deal with it quickly and effectively. We now understand more than ever before about how children and young people's confidence, resilience, participation and attainment can be affected by bullying both in the short and the long term. How and where children and young people are experiencing bullying, how they can be supported and most importantly how it can be prevented. During Anti-Bullying Week we are asking adults and young people alike to get involved in a national conversation about what respect means to them. Respect is central to all relationships and it should be at the heart of how we treat each other. We all have a role to play in promoting respectful behaviour. To that end, the government has this week announced the, uh, the details of the new guidance on anti-bullying, which was uh, influenced by the contents of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee consideration on this question. Respect for all, the national approach to anti-bullying for, Scot for Scotland's children and young people forms part of our wider attempts to improve the health and well-being of our children and young people. It fits in with our ongoing work to promote positive behaviour and ensure that children and young people feel safe, secure and are able to build up strong and positive relationships. Respect for All is also underpinned by the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and places children's rights at the very centre of the policy approach that we have adopted. It sets out a common vision and aims to make sure that work across all agencies and communities is consistently and coherently contributing to a uniform approach to anti-bullying within Scotland. Respect for all, of course, is not just for schools. It's for everyone involved in children and young people's lives in Scotland. The guidance outlines the common expectations of everyone in preventing and managing bullying, as well as what they can expect from others. This includes local authorities, schools, governing bodies, independent and voluntary services, youth clubs, parents and carers, and children and young people themselves. 
We expect all schools and organisations to develop and implement an anti-bullying policy that involves all stakeholders, including children and young people, parents, carers and staff. Respect for All encourages everyone to take a proactive and holistic approach to anti-bullying, regardless of the type of bullying that is experienced. And this includes an explicit commitment to address prejudice-based bullying. This government believes there is no place in Scotland for prejudice or discrimination and that everyone deserves to be treated fairly. We must continue to address prejudice and discrimination and to promote equality and diversity and continue to introduce these messages at the early stages of a child's development. Respect for All is clear about the impact of prejudice-based bullying, including homophobic, biphobic and transphobic bullying, and how schools, youth and sports organisations can respond appropriately. As one of the quotes in Respect for All from a 15-year-old says, people have a right to be themselves and no one should deny them that. And the position is expressed no more clearly than by the 15-year-old that is quoted in the document. Respect for All includes also uh, an importance of ensuring that uh, the instances of bullying are properly recorded, monitored and acted upon. Um, I'm certain that Parliament understands that effective monitoring allows organisations to gauge the effectiveness of their policy and practice and to inform the review and update their policy on a regular basis. Monitoring of bullying incidents is essential and helps organisations identify recurring patterns, thereby ensuring early intervention and appropriate support. I am clear that we need a consistent, uniform approach to recording and monitoring. Following the committee's inquiry and subsequent report, I have discussed this issue with a number of key stakeholder organisations regarding the approach that we should take to recording and, and, and monitoring instances of bullying. What is clear from these discussions is that we need to make immediate progress on this question to ensure that we can take the steps practically to put in place the measures to enable such an arrangement to be put in place. That's why I've commissioned a working group to convene involving Education Scotland, COSLA, the Association of Directors of Education, local authority officers, the teaching unions, parents groups and LGBTI groups to develop additional supporting guidance on the process for recording and monitoring and why we are actively looking at the practical measures that will enable us to, uh, to consider that material and to implement it in practice through the CMIS system, which is used habitually to record information on events and instances within our school system. So the approach that we're taking is a timely and swift approach to ensure that we can properly record the instances of bullying and, and tackle it, of course. Jamie Green. Uh, I thank the member for taking my intervention. Uh, I, I, it's very uh, uh, welcome to hear those words of progress on the recording uh, of bullying, but I, my worry is that whilst uh, I hear the phrase immediate steps being taken, I also hear in the same sentence another working group being set up. Uh, what sort of timeline are we looking at so that we may see some practical on the ground results of recording of metrics so that we can actually measure performance in the future? John Swinney. The, the progress that I want to make uh, early progress on this issue, but it's a practical question. It's about putting in place the mechanisms that will enable schools to properly record instances of bullying so that we can assess and consider exactly the points that Mr Green makes about practice. So th these are practical logistical issues that need to be confronted. We've taken the decision in principle. There's going to be a uniform recording system across the country. I'm now simply turning that into practice and I have to work with our local authorities and the schools around the country to put that into practical effect. So I'm very happy to report to Parliament about the progress that we make, but this is the swiftest route to make sure we have a uniform recording system in place. If I was to rely on statute, it would take significantly longer to have a, 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 such a system in place. That's why I've opted for the earliest possible route to ensure that the recording of these instances can be considered and assessed. Presiding officer, um, can I turn now, and I'll do more justice to this in my concluding remarks, to the questions that Mr Dornan raises about personal and social education, because following the publication by the Minister for Mental Health of the Mental Health Strategy in March, I commissioned Education Scotland to undertake a national review of uh, personal social education within schools. 
There are three elements to that uh, review. Phase one, which is now complete, covered communications and initial exploration of PSE teaching resources. Phase two began in October and it covers the thematic review of the delivery of PSE in schools across Scotland. And phase three, um, which will uh, commence in June 2018, will analyse findings and develop recommendations. It's important that the scope and the remit of the review has been informed and shaped through consultation with our local authority partners and with educational practitioners who have expertise in PSE, pastoral support and counselling. Education Scotland has now started the first set of visits to schools and early learning and childcare centres and they will undertake approximately 55 visits as part of this process. I will of course update Parliament on the, process of the progress of the review and ensure that the measures are taken forward in a timely fashion to ensure the objectives set out by Mr Donner are fully addressed as part of the review of personal and social education. Call Michelle Ballantyne, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer, and thank you to both the committees for their important work around these issues. Many of us in this chamber are fortunate enough to have positive memories of a school life that wasn't blighted by being bullied. However, sadly, I'm sure there were some that were never happier than the day they closed the door on their school life. Bullying is not a new phenomenon. It is a facet of human behaviour driven often by a need to exert power and is particularly noticeable in schools. Parents, schools, governments and young people have wrestled with the challenge of how to eliminate bullying and the sad truth is we will never stop it completely but we can and must do everything we can to minimise the frequency to ensure both those who choose to act this way and those who are impacted are supported. Today's debate is focusing on prejudice-based bullying the negative judgment of someone based on characteristics such as disability, race, religion or sexual orientation. The effects of prejudice-based bullying can be manifest. The victim may feel socially isolated and unable to talk to anyone about their experiences. They may develop anxiety or other mental health conditions, or they may even feel compelled to take their own life. Indeed, presiding officer, the fact that 27% of LGBT young people attempted suicide at least once as a consequence of prejudice-based bullying should engage and alarm all of us. Prejudice-based bullying cannot be tackled by a one-size-fits-all approach. We must recognise that there is a complex and involving spectrum of acts which might constitute bullying. What we do know is that the nature and method of bullying has changed over the years. The advent of the digital age, and particularly social media, has done little to stem the rise of this bullying. Children and young people are now expressing opinions without thought and behind the veil of an anonymity of a codename, saying and doing things they would not do if it was in the full glare of their peers. Whether careless commentary or targeted attack, the pervasive nature of social media has given a new lifeblood to prejudice-based bullying. A single comment or photo can reach whole school communities in minutes. And unlike when most of us were young, it doesn't stop at the school gate. It reaches out to other schools and social settings and it follows the victim home. It is this lack of relief from the torment that can lead a young person to believe that taking their own life is preferable to enduring another day of the comments and attacks they may face. So what can we do to change this? We know that children learn many of their prejudice and societal norms from their parents, peers and the adults in their lives such as teachers and celebrity role models. We also know that child development means that children become more sensitive to others as they mature. Although our society is more inclusive than ever, we see a rise in prejudicial bullying so we cannot be complacent and it is clear we need to review the way we deliver personal and social education in our schools. I welcome the fact that a review is underway and I hope that it will bring to this chamber some useful recommendations. I would, however, like to take this opportunity to raise some salient points about PSE. If we are serious about tackling prejudice-based bullying, we need the right people to do the right jobs. Dr Joanne Mowat, Senior Education Lecturer at the University of Strathclyde, highlighted that PSE is typically delivered by the least experienced members of staff with often minimal support or guidance in its delivery. We must remember that our teachers first and foremost are subject specialists. This is particularly true in secondary schools. They are historians, they are linguists, they are chemists, they are mathematicians. 
They are not social scientists, counsellors, sexual health educators or substance misuse specialists. Teaching a complex and multifaceted issue such as PSE also requires a very specific skill set. PSE is a subject and a specialism in its own right. To teach it piecemeal without appropriate background and context can do far more harm than good. When you factor in the existing workload pressures facing our teachers, it is clear that the current inconsistent delivery of PSE teaching is unsustainable. Presiding officer, this cannot continue. PSE, as we know it, must be overhauled. We need to see greater involvement from external contributors with relevant experience and training in the specialist areas that make up PSE. We need to ensure that every young person has access to and knows that there is a safe place where they can go and that they will be listened to in confidence. We need to ensure that teacher training includes awareness of the use of language and the impact that even a perceived joke can have on a young person. We need to ensure that our embracing of the digital age does not take possession of the school classroom and enable covert bullying to take place. The committee's reports and this debate should be the impetus for taking this issue forward. Let's collectively make sure it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ballantyne. I call Daniel Johnson. Six minutes, Mr. Johnson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by thanking both the committees, but perhaps more importantly, to the many organisations and individuals who helped contribute to these two important reports. Um, a discussion on bullying and personal education is well timed, as many people have pointed out already. Uh, this is currently anti bullying week. And of course, it's not always easy for parliamentary debates or committee reports to capture the subtleties or realities of subjects such as social education or bullying in our schools. But we have a duty to explore these issues because of the devastating impacts and tolerance and exclusion can have for our young people. Reading these reports, I can't be the only one to have thought about the similarities with my own school experiences. More often than not, when I'm dealing with education matters, I, I remark on how much progress we've made, about how much more developed our thinking is in education. But when it comes to bullying, I, I find it depressing to read how entrenched a problem it is and remains. And we need to understand in this debate that the, ter the terrible effects that bullying can have on children and young people, the impact that can be deeply felt, whether in it's one-off instance or smaller cumulative cruelties. And, and clearly, there is a connection to personal and social education through developing better understanding of young people's personal and social needs, supporting their understanding of themselves and of each other. Hopefully, we can make progress. So, this is an important debate, one which brings two important reports together. And I'd like to try, in my uh, remarks, to, to draw on the, the, the common themes uh, and the overlaps between the two reports. On bullying, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee have taken a difficult subject, bullying, and provided a genuinely helpful look at how children's rights uh, 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 and uh, prejudice and bullying all intersect, providing better understanding, clarity on definitions and, indeed, terminology. And on PSC, the Education and Skills Committee have provided a useful marker of what is going right, but also what must be improved in our schools. Both reports are clear on the shortfalls and areas where there is a lack of consistency between schools. So there's a number of broader common themes between the two reports, the first of which I think is clearly mental health. The impact on children's mental health from bullying is a clear conclusion of the Equalities and uh, Committee report. It is vital that those impacted by bullying receive speedy and appropriate support, including through in-school counselling, but also beyond schools. And that means the government must tackle the unacceptable waiting times for CAMS. Likewise, the PSC report pointed to the need for mental health become a larger part of the curriculum. The committee received a powerful contribution following a report calling for more resources for PSC, especially in the light of rising expectations that we all have for what it should be delivered. But also uh, about the reality that for many teachers, they, they find themselves ill-equipped to explore the complicated issues of mental health for young people. The next theme is about the need for consistent policy and regular reviews. Both reports pointed to their hopes and expectations for the government's anti-bullying approach, and it is very welcome having that here today. Indeed, I, think I would remark on, on its, uh, 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 how it sets out the need for schools to have a, a consistent policy, and I think there are many positive things that both committees called for. And likewise, I welcome uh, the Deputy First Minister's uh, details that he provided today about the Education Scotland Review into PSE. Again, I think that the, the requirements that the committee made out 
I think are, are clear and I hope they are met by that review. Both committees grappled with the tension, and I think there is a real tension here, between the principles of curriculum for excellence, but also the desire for consistency across schools. And I think this is a tricky issue, because while our schools must be able to create their own and individual approaches to anti-bullying and PSE, especially given the evidence that they have from their own context communities, we must also ensure that there is a minimum level, a minimum level of expectation and policy that every ch child can expect. So we must ensure that we spread best practice across the whole school system, but this cannot come at the cost of schools being able to make uh, their own decisions and take different approaches. But perhaps the most important point that comes from both reports is that of culture. We know that we cannot reduce bullying uh, to simple policy points or instill the right learning simply through PSC or, or guidance alone. Behaviours are shaped by a much wider range of contexts and behaviours. Change needs to be through the whole school community, that everyone needs to buy into anti-bullying measures if they are to work. Similarly, we must involve children and young people in the creation of personal and social education that is going to be relevant and therefore work for young people. And I think the Education Committee's comments around co-production are vital and important. I would also like to make one small remark about initial teacher education. Both reports highlight on the need to improve teacher training and also CPD. The PSC report highlights about the need to discuss, uh, improve subjects such as LGBTI inclusiveness, and the bullying report also about the emphasis of language and rights. However, I would want, 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 want to make one small mark of, of caution, because while these things are undoubtedly true and important, I think what we're all familiar that about the call for education to solve a great many of society's aims, whether it's personal finance through to, to uh, uh, intolerance or other issues. And I think much is the same in, in education, that we seek to we, uh, fix those issues by calls on changes to the initial teacher education. And while we do need to do that, it is not a simple magic bullet. And I would caution about that, but we must also look to make improvements. So in conclusion, presiding officer, both reports huge, help hugely in clarity in these two important issues. But we have a, a long way to go in eliminating bullying and improving PSE. But I have no doubt these reports in this debate take us a step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. Move to the open debate. Speeches a tight six minutes. I call Claire Hockey to be followed by Brian Whittle. Ms Hockey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Scotland is no different from any other country across the world in that our young people and children are living increasingly complex lives. Sadly, many experience, many experience bullying and stresses at school, whilst others may be facing a multitude of problems at home such as poverty or abuse. These are pressures which have existed for generations. However, with the increase in the usage of social media and with people's lives now being shared online, such problems can be amplified and are harder to escape from. Helping our children and young people cope with these pressures is of paramount importance and schools can play a leading role in supporting them through the teaching of PSE. President Officer, alongside the formal evidence sessions and focus groups held, the Education and Skills Committee also asked the public what should personal and social education sessions be about and how should it be delivered? And the response the committee received from pupils, as mentioned by James Dornan, on social media and by email was overwhelming. And the committee is incredibly clear that pupils find good quality PSE as being invaluable to them. It was evident that there are particular subjects which should be taught in PSE, including sex and relationships education, inclusivity, drug and alcohol misuse, financial planning, and learning and talking about mental health. Sex and relationship education, the core issue the committee concludes should be taught in PSE, is one which must go further than merely talking about biology, but by properly discussing sex and relationships. And the committee took evidence from various organisations and charities who were of the opinion that at school there is a real lack of teaching about consent and of the diversity of relationships, including that of LGBTI relationships. Shockingly, the committee received evidence that some LGBTI young people's sex education was learned online due to a lack of adequate provision from within their schools. Nonetheless, across Scotland, there are many positive and innovative examples of how PSE is taught in our schools, and there are several which could be looked at as models for best practice. 
I was delighted to learn that Cathkin High School and my own constituency of Rutherglen have an incredibly varied and thorough PSC programme, teaching about relationships and sexual health in their PSC classes from second through to fourth year. Trinity High School, again in my constituency, has worked with external organisations during PSC lessons. <clears throat> Excuse me. For example, police and fire service personnel come to these classes to allow pupils to learn what's happening outside of the school environment. And this ensures that their PSC reflects and, reflects and is tailored to the real world. Drawing on the expertise of those outside of teaching provides another perspective on life and equips students with the skills and information they need to thrive. This was one of the committee's recommendations which the Cabinet Secretary agreed with in their response to the report that PSE should be, should be used to involve external contributors with their relevant specialism. So I was particularly pleased to hear that this is already happening in South Lanarkshire schools. But unfortunately, unfortunately there are schools across Scotland whose delivery of the subject is not as high as not to such a high standard as others. And one of the main issues found throughout the report was the lack of consistency and effectiveness in PSC delivery. An issue which was also highlighted by the session for Health and Sport Committee and the current Equalities and Human Rights Committees. Presiding officer, although PSC is not mandatory, there are statutory requirements in relation to health and equalities. But the committee is concerned that the importance placed on health and wellbeing is not borne out in all schools across the board. Through Curriculum for Excellence, health and wellbeing is spread across the curriculum and it's one of the three core areas that are the responsibility of all staff in the school, with the other two being literacy and numeracy. Despite this aim from central government and given the fact that the Schools Health Promotion and Nutrition Scotland Act 2007 places a duty in all schools to be health promoting, the committee found that this was not always the case at local level. This health promoting duty includes mental health. However, this was one of the areas that respondents persuasively reported, or, uh, reported is not sufficiently included in PSE. The Scottish Youth Parliament's submission to the committee on this topic said that young people have told them that there's not enough focus on mental health. Their research, to which almost 1,500 young people contributed, also found that the quality of education on mental health and wellbeing is varied across the country. Sam H estimates that three pupils in every classroom will have experienced a mental health issue by the time they're aged 16, whilst the World Health Organisation has found that up to 20% of children and adolescents across the world suffer a mental illness in any given year. And who do many of these children and young people turn to for help? Their class teachers and their guidance teachers. Young people want to learn and to talk about sex and relationships, alcohol and drug misuse and mental health issues in an atmosphere where they feel safe and supported. So we should give them this opportunity at school and during PSE. Schools are vital settings for promoting positive well-being, challenging mental health stigma and tackling bi-trans and homophobia. So I hope key stakeholders across Scotland note the conclusions and recommendations made by the committee's report. The committee was clear, PSE in its current form is too inconsistent and I'm pleased that the government has committed to reviewing it within the new mental health strategy. I have confidence in the Scottish Government to complete this review in the near future to ensure that all schools across Scotland teach good quality PSE for the benefit of all our pupils. Thank you very much, Ms Hawkey. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Gail Ross. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I point uh, the members to my register of interest? And I'm a, a board member of the West of Scotland NSPCC. And I'd also like to thank the committees uh, for bringing this debate to the Chamber and the organisations who have contributed briefing papers to this debate. It is a debate I, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to contribute to. Uh, but I've got to be honest, I take no pleasure in having to speak to a topic that can be so destructive in the lives of our school pupils. When we look at our schools in the hope that we are affording each and every pupil the opportunity to be all they want to be, to open up their eyes to the possibilities, and as often said, ensure that school days are the very best years of their lives. It's a time when pupils are not only developing their academic skills, they're also learning social skills, interacting, developing relationships, building re resilience. In other words, developing the basic academic and social skills that will define them into and throughout their adulthood. And the experiences we go through in our school years stay with us throughout our lifetime. So it's vitally important that pupils get the wide opportunity as possible to participate, to integrate, to try, to fail, and to bounce back and succeed. 
to be as much a part of everyday school life as possible. And here lies the crux of today's debate for me. Prejudice, abuse or bullying of any kind, be it physical or mental, can have such a devastating effect on this personal development process. We're talking about withdrawing from the very opportunities and activities that can have such a positive impact on individual and collective development. We're talking about victims taking themselves out of the mainstream, out of harm's way as they see it, being on the outside, looking in. Or as Sam H put it, good mental health is based on inclusivity and activity. So we are talking about health and well-being, health inequalities, attainment and mental health. We're talking about a, a very low self-esteem, self-loathing and ultimately seeking escapism through self-destructive behaviours such as self-harming, overeating, drug, alcohol abuse or even suicide. All these topics are very familiar to this chamber and, and are often discussed but I have not really heard them uh, mentioned in the same breath as prejudice, abuse or bullying. I only mention this because I think that when we are looking for solutions, it's important how we link all these issues and look at the wider implications. If we could really tackle abuse and prejudice at source, what impact could that have on our school pupils' mental health, has been mentioned, or the strain on CAMS referrals, or on attainment, on physical activity uptake, or, or even uh, obesity? If you're from my generation, bullying was something you did, looking someone in the eye. That sort of abuse, sorting out issues with your fists or name calling is, is being dealt with on the whole, although I, I would imagine that we have all had casework where bullying is still swept under the carpet, which is why I was really pleased to and welcomed the, the Cabinet Secretary's assurances about education and, and evidence-based action. However, harassment and bullying has evolved. Cyberbullying is now a major concern and somehow that seems worse to me because the victim remains unseen, so the impact of their behaviour is not witnessed by the perpetrator. And this chamber obviously would understand the cowardice of keyboard bullies who wouldn't say what they say online if they were looking you in the eye. And in a way, this has removed a barrier to bullying. So we need to continue, continually evolve our approach. And I just want to take this opportunity to mention the work of the NSPCC as a shining light in, in tackling abuse uh, through education and going into primary schools because often children that are being abused don't recognise that they're being abused. And, and Deputy Presiding Officer, we've talked about the consequences of getting this wrong, and I, and I wanted to share a story with the Chamber a bit that highlights the outcomes that can happen when we get it right. When my middle daughter was at primary school, one of her classmates, classmates had a, a significant physical disability confined to a motorised wheelchair, but was part of, of mainstream education, and, and a really, really bright boy. And that school and all the pupils went out of their way to make sure he was included in just about everything he possibly could be. And the kids absolutely loved him. And every time I spoke to him, uh, he was bubbly and bright and full of enthusiasm. And it was the very same at secondary school. And I did lose touch with him and what he was up to until earlier this year when a team of MSPs was being ritually and systematically shown up and humbled at the Scottish Power Chair Football Championships. And up he bowls to say hello. And there was no mistaking who he was because he looks virtually the same as he did back then. Uh, I, I, and, he, and he proceeds to tell me about his desire to start his own business. Now, I'm not going to share that business with you in case somebody's watching and nicks his idea because it's an absolute cracker. So he's a very bright young man intent on making his mark. And that's how it should be. That's the kind of outcome that, can be, that, that, that being included uh, can deliver. Follow him on Facebook. He actually calls himself Wee Bod Big Heed. He's a remarkable young man, accompanied by a wicked sense of humour, and many of, his, many of his classmates are still in touch. Social media at its very best, all started by a school totally committed to treating him the same way as every other pupil, as an individual, as the, the, the Cabinet Secretary highlighted. That surely speaks to the very foundation of getting it right for every child principal. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, it wouldn't necessarily take complicated interventions and legislation from this place. What we need to look at is ensuring that our educators have the tools at their disposal through their education to be comfortable in teaching, integrating and including all pupils in aspects of life. Education, Deputy Presiding Officer, the basis of so many of the solutions we seek, uh, as every submission in this debate has highlighted. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, let's educate, pre educate prejudice, bullying, and harassment out of our society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. I hope somebody caught your uh, reference to a site there. I think you better give them a note of the name of that Facebook site.
Uh, call Gail Ross, followed by Monica Lennon, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to begin by reminding the Chamber that my husband is a teacher. When the Equalities and Human Rights Committee started taking evidence on this issue, it was apparent that it was far more widespread and deep-seated than anyone had imagined. And I would also like to put on record my thanks to everyone that gave evidence. Some of the testimony we heard can't have been easy, and I hope that you know that you have already helped others with your bravery. I'm sorry to say that some of the stories that we heard were absolutely shocking. We should not shy away from the fact that bullying in some of our schools is very real, it's affecting ch children's mental health, and it's preventing some people from reaching their full potential through its profoundly damaging impact on children's self-esteem. In his opening statement to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, the Deputy First Minister said, I make it absolutely clear that the government considers bullying of any kind to be completely unacceptable. Wherever it occurs, we have a responsibility to take action to deal with it quickly and effectively. The government believes that there is no place in Scotland for prejudice or discrimination and that everyone deserves to be treated fairly. And this statement is very welcome. We have a duty of care to every young person and I thank the Deputy First Minister for his honesty when he came to give evidence at our commi committee session in June. And it's a testament to the work of our committee and the clerks that the government have agreed to or are considering all of the report's recommendations. We heard of pupils being picked on for their sexual orientation, a disability, for their religion, for their skin colour, their gender, their foreign accent. Moreover, sexual harassment with girls being raided and given nicknames based on how they look or dress is also rife. We also see instances of children being tormented and made to feel as if they are less due to their socio-economic background or their appearance. As has been mentioned before, there is a huge rise in social media use. Cyberbullying is a massive problem and it can happen at any time of the day, not just in school. Assaults, including those of a sexual nature, are being videoed and we had a robust discussion around the issue of consent. Technology is moving so quickly that it's hard to keep up with apps such as Snapchat and how they can and are being used. Teachers need to be equipped with the knowledge and understanding of how to deal with these issues, but as a society, we need to teach our children why they are wrong in the first place. Teachers can only do so much. Parents also have a responsibility to educate and inform. Presiding officer, we all know that being a teacher is a very important and sometimes a very difficult job. They are shaping the future. They have the chance to make sure our young people are nurtured, respected and listened to. They teach them facts and figures, yes, but they also have a duty of pastoral care. Unfortunately, in committee, we heard some very uncomfortable evidence about the conduct of some teachers and local authorities. We heard about lack of care, lack of understanding of personal issues, lack of response to incidents of bullying, lack of proper investigations by some local authorities to complaints from parents and a complete disregard for scrutiny or anyone being held to account. Presiding officer, to put this in perspective, we know not every teacher in every, in every classroom behaves like this, but even one is one too many. And there are many brilliant teachers in schools all over the country that we are rightly proud of and a minority of individuals are not representative of the sector, and I'm sure most teachers will be horrified to hear of these accounts. In our committee report, we asked the Scottish Government to work with providers of training for teachers so that greater emphasis is placed on equalities, the handling of bullying incidents, the protected characteristics, and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. It would be helpful if the Scottish Government could provide more information on how the review of professional standards by the GTC will take into account the Equality Act 2010 and also the committee's recommendations on continuous professional development. The standards for registration sets out a number of behaviours that teachers must adhere to. We must make sure that all local authorities are aware of how to deal with these reports as well. Education directors, managers and officers all have a duty of care. We ask the Scottish Government and the education authorities to make CPD training on equalities, the protected characteristics and children's human rights 
compulsory. We ask the Scottish Government to take steps to ensure all teacher training makes the position clear that Section 28 was repealed in Scots law by the Scottish Parliament on the 15th of March 2001. And the fact that this was one of the first pieces of legislation enacted by our Parliament demonstrates our outright rejection of the denial of LGBTI inclusive education and gives us the opportunity to go further in the provision, especially in regards to relationships, sexual health, and parental education. There are great examples in Scotland of schools with a zero tolerance approach to bullying and we have a lot to learn from them. We need to foster a whole school ethos where everyone is equal and respected, pupils and teachers, because respect goes both ways. And as a final ask, presiding officer, it's essential that all equalities and human rights organisations that we heard from in committee are consulted going forward, including representatives from those that deal with race, gender, LGBTI, young people's issues, as well as children's charities. If we are to stamp out bullying in our schools and make our classrooms truly inclusive, we have to make sure that the process to get there is also truly inclusive. For as rightly noted by LGBT Scotland... No, you must conclude. I'm sorry. You must conclude. I call Monica Lennon, followed by Colin Beattie, please. Thank you, and I'm pleased to follow a fantastic speech by Gail Ross that was cut short at the end here. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to contribute, and I'd like to begin by congratulating both the Equalities and Human Rights Committee and the Education and Skills Committee for their work on these important and cross-cutting issues which we are debating today. Whilst there is much to celebrate for too many young people in Scotland today, their time at school is a battle. Bullying means school for them becomes something to be endured rather than enjoyed. Instead of being an environment in which they are thriving, prejudice-based bullying means some young people are instead struggling to survive. The Thai campaign research is well established and well known amongst colleagues in this chamber, but the sheer awfulness of their research findings bears repeating as loudly and as often as possible. 90% of LGBTI young people experience bullying at school because of their identity. 27% of those attempt to take their own life and 15% try more than once. Beyond these statistics are real stories, real people and real devastation due to the havoc wreaked upon individuals because of the prejudice they face. Today, I want to take the opportunity to talk about the experience of one of my young constituents who I've been supporting in recent months due to the absolutely appalling treatment they've faced at school as a result of their gender identity. I think their story, albeit anonymised, can tell us more about what needs to change and why than standalone statistics or reports ever can. This young trans person has been the victim of appalling, an appalling catalogue of abuse and harassment by other pupils at a school in South Lanarkshire. From name calling, physical assault, to consistent online harassment and verbal abuse, it really is as bad as it can get. The situation has deteriorated to the point where this young person has already, on one occasion, tried to take their own life. The campaign of abuse, which remains ongoing and incessant, means my young constituent faces a daily battle of torment, frequently missing out on school because the pressure of facing the harassers is just too much to cope with. And this young person is still, to date, struggling to access the adequate support they need from the school, in large part because of a lack of adequate reporting and recording of incidents um, which are prejudice-based in nature, and an apparent inability on the part of the school leadership to see these bullying incidents as part of what is a wider cultural problem which amounts to a pattern of abuse. The school can't even recognise a hate crime when it sees one. I'm continuing to work with this young person, their family, the school, and I met with the local authority again last week to try and make some progress. But it's been heartbreaking at times to witness the utter dejectedness which this young person has come to expect at such a young age. Because recent, when recently speaking with them, I heard something which seemed to sum up their experience so well, and yet it is something which is also so utterly unacceptable. That school for them, for this young person, isn't or can't be about making friends or having an enjoyable experience. It's simply about them trying to survive through their next few years so that they can receive 
and education. That sentiment is a shocking indictment on the experience of some of our LGBT young people, and we must do better. School should not be a battle, so we need to change, and urgently. Because as we know the experience of my young constituent, it's not the experience of all young LGBT people in schools. On a more positive note, earlier this week, I had the fortune of being in Brannock High School in Motherwell, and I was there with the Thai campaign. I was overwhelmed and amazed by the supportive environment which they fostered in their school. Brannock High is clearly outward looking and forward thinking. And it was a delight to speak to their LGBTI committee, newly established in August, which provides a welcoming and safe network for pupils of all ages in that school. As a visitor to the school, the commitment and passion of Miss Divers, who helped to set up the committee, and the head teacher, Mr Calhoun, was clear to see and truly impressive. So on Monday, we talked about today's debate. They know that it's happening. And the young people were really keen that their voices could be heard today. So I've agreed to read out some of their questions. So from the experts themselves, which includes Jamie McLean, Rachel Dillon, Sophie Steele and Kira Gillespie, uh, here are some of the issues that the group raised with me, uh, for me to raise with you all today. What can be done to ensure that all teachers receive compulsory training on LGBTI inclusive education? How we could make content on LGBTI issues in family life and sexual health and PSE compulsory for all schools and pupils? And how LGBTI bullying can be recorded so we know the true bullying figures and can be confident that schools are recording it. I'm sure the pupils at Brannock will be interested to hear from the committee and the government on these points. With the right attitudes and support, we know that things can be different and the experience of Brannock High School gives me hope that things can and will change. But it shouldn't be down to your luck or what catchment or what postcodes you live in. That's why I believe, and I'll just finish here, that we do need legislative change with the obligation on the recording of prejudice-based bullying placing a statutory footing, as well as a legal duty for all education establishments to provide inclusive sex and relationship education. It strikes me today there's wide agreement across these benches. It's the pace of change that we now need to work on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Lennon. I call Colin Beattie to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Mr Beattie, please. Presiding officer, over the years, the concept of bullying has changed and evolved as we became more aware of the impact of the differing ways in which bullying can be inflicted. And there's no doubt that bullying at a young age can have a long-lasting adverse effect on those in the receiving end. Respect Me, Scotland's anti-bullying service, defines bullying in the following terms. Bullying is both behaviour and impact. What someone does and the impact it has on the other person's capacity to feel in control of themselves, we call this their sense of agency. Bullying takes place in the context of relationships. It's behaviour that can make people feel hurt, threatened, frightened and left out and it can happen face-to-face -face and online. And it's important to understand these terms defining bullying so we can recognise it immediately and understand how to minimise it. Respect Me goes further in noting how bullying behaviour can be solitary incidents and not just repetitive, and how such behaviour may not be intentional, but the impact on the person being bullied is no less severe. Bullying is distinct from criminal offences such as hate crime, child sexual exploitation and gender-based violence. Respect Me's 2014 survey, Bullying in Scotland, provided some context as to the present situation. More than 8,000 children and young people were surveyed, of which 30% stated they'd been bullied in the 2013-14 school year. Of this sector, 60% had been bullied in person, 19% online only, and 21% a mixture of the two. Unsurprisingly, the most common type of bullying behaviour was name-calling, hurtful comments and rumour spreading. Against this background, in May this year, the Education Committee produced the report, Let's Talk About Personal and Social Education. The committee took evidence from roundtable sessions and online surveys, and had a tremendous response that emphasised the importance of good personal and social education, PSE, and yet noted how the delivery of PSE can be variable across the country. PSE can cover a wide range of topics, uh, including study skills, sex and relationships, drugs and alcohol awareness, with the intention of enabling children to gain a greater understanding of such topics and developing the skills and attributes they need to thrive. As part of the committee's work, 
uh, in producing this report, focus groups were held at Dalkeith High School in my constituency. And I'm pleased to report that a beneficial and supportive PSE is clearly valued and appreciated at that school. As examples, students noted that outside agencies, such as employers and colleges, advised them on issues such as pathways into careers, and also teachers made themselves available outside PSE sessions, so pupils were, were able to meet them at different times. In terms of transgender children and LGBT issues, the school confirmed that Stonewall comes in to provide support and that the school has its own LGBT support group. However, in other cases the committee heard of, LG, LGTB support through PSE lessons was not as valued as that at Dalkeith High School. We heard from students who were bullied and struggled with who they were because of a lack of LGBTI inclusive PSE lessons, and from those who believed their sex education lessons focused on all the terrible things, including shocking videos, that can happen to you if you have sex or take drugs, rather than a constructive approach that informs pupils of the support available to them. In one case, a pupil was apparently told by his school he would go to hell because of his sexuality. When Scotland's young people are facing such attitudes from our own educational establishments at a time when they should be receiving the maximum of emotional support, it's clear that steps need to be taken to address the issue. Stonewall, Stonewall Scotland's 2012 school report provides context to the LGBTI issues, including that 52% of lesbian, gay and bisexual young people had experienced homophobic bullying behaviour in our schools, and that 26% of such young people had tried to take their own life at some point. And these statistics are profoundly shocking and do highlight where action needs to be taken. With its explicit commitment to addressing prejudice-based bullying, respect for all encompasses a vision that I would hope is supported by everyone here today. I have touched on some of these points already, but they bear repeating. Every child and young person in Scotland will grow up free from bullying and will develop respectful, responsible and confident relationships with other children, young people and adults. Children and young people and their parents will have the skills and resilience to prevent and respond to bullying appropriately. Every child and young person who requires help will know who can help them and what support is available. Adults working with children and young people will follow a consistent, coherent approach in dealing with and preventing bullying from early learning and childcare always, onwards. Now, there are many actions we can take to allow us to help instill the consensual understanding and empathetic attitudes in our young people. Attitudes they can carry forward through their post-school lives and into society and work environments. And in this way, we can make Scotland into a fairer, more tolerant country in the years ahead. Prejudice-based bullying can manifest itself in many forms and encompasses a wide range of prejudices from race, sexuality, disability, body image, religious beliefs and gender identity. Those who pick up bullying habits at a young age are likely to keep them throughout their lives and indeed such habits may translate themselves onward into the children of such people. The Scottish Government will now take forward the review of personal and social education alongside the steps outlined in Respect for All. And I very much welcome uh, the, the Scottish Government taking this forward. In conclusion, I would like to thank those who gave evidence and all who have contributed towards this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Beattie. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Neil Finlay. Mr. Balfour, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. President Officer, I have to confess when I was sitting on the Equalities and Human Rights Committee and we decided to do an inquiry into this area, I have to say I was a bit sceptical and thought surely things have moved on since I was at school. But a bit like Mr. Johnson, as we heard the evidence over the number of weeks, I was shocked, um, as someone who lives in 21st century Scotland, of how perhaps little progress has been made at the grassroots of schools. And I say that as a parent of two young children who are starting off their educational career, that as they will go through school and as their contemporaries will go through school and as my constituents will go through school, that if their experience is anything like some of the evidence we heard, then we should hold our heads in shame as a society. The comment, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never break me, is perhaps one of the false truths that we have to stop saying as society. Because words do affect people, 
not only at the time they are said, but as they go on through their lives, often it will shape them and shape the person they are. I want to just pick up on two characteristics of individuals who are bullied and then offer a couple of comments briefly, presiding officer. In paragraph 43 of the um, Equality and um, Human Rights Committee, most of the evidence exists suggests that disabled people are twice more likely to be bullied than that of a non-disabled child. Now that bullying can take place in regard to what happens in the classroom, but for, far more likely it's what happens in the lunchroom, the playground, or on Facebook. And we need to realise that if we are going to have, and I think we, last week we had a, a very helpful debate on inclusive education, but if we truly are going to have inclusive um, education, then we need to make sure that disabled people, uh, whatever their disability, are protected. And that is true particularly of those who perhaps have uh, mental health issues or have disabilities around that area, who often are far more, far more likely to be disabled than even those with physical disability. Can I also say that I think we um, are at an interesting juncture in regard to where we are with faith, belief. Uh, as faith, belief perhaps changes within our society, as people uh, come to different views, as traditional uh, religions perhaps are being uh, turned upon by people or turned away from people, um, I think we have to say how does um, the perhaps traditional child who believes in Islam or Judaism or Christianity fit into our schools and how do we protect them from having their beliefs and their thoughts held at the same time. Can I say I think the way forward and, and evidence came out of this in a number of groups is that what we need and I think Scottish Government is working towards this is a holistic approach that we have to say all bullying in whatever form it takes is wrong and we have to work that through our syllabus. It was interesting when we were talking um, to people about race bullying, um, when there are incidents of race bullying going on, it perhaps gets a higher priority in regard to what happens in schools. And then when it drops off the agenda a bit, it's not taught as much. And I think there is a danger that if we pick on one characteristic over another characteristic, whether we say disability is more important than race at this time, we, we end up with some groups uh, missing out. I think it does start with what happens in the classroom, what is taught by our teachers. And that actually starts with what teachers are taught in the teacher training. Uh, one teacher uh, told us at committee that they had half a day on bullying for disabled children. So if you happen to have a code on that four-year course, you missed out completely. And that was true with other characteristics as well. And I do think we need to look at what our teachers are being taught. We, I welcome uh, the uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary's um, comment about how we record it. Because again, most of the evidence we took was that it is unrecorded and lots of incidents are still going by. I think we need to involve parents in regard to this. We need to see how we can involve parents educate parents. Uh, people like myself have been away from school for many years. Uh, how do I help my children face these issues if they are bullied, or heaven forbid, they become the bullier? How do parents involve this? And as many people have said, we need to involve the children in our schools, both who are facing this, but also those who might face it in the future. Um, I welcome both these reports. Um, I welcome all the evidence that has been given to the two committees. And as other members have already said, um, I think those who were brave enough to come before our committees and give that evidence have hopefully started something that will change our society. And I hope the message that comes out from this parliament today and in the months ahead is that bullying is wrong and there's no place for it in 21st century Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Ross Greer. Mr uh, Finlay, please. Thanks, President Officer. Can I declare an interest as a member of the EIS and a former teacher? Um, I, I actually think the word bullying is a very misused term. Uh, yesterday, the dispute over the ONS withdrawal of data on taxation saw so the Tories accused the Scottish Government of bullying. Every day we hear someone who makes a legitimate criticism of a, another person or a group charged with being a bully. We hear the increasingly ludicrous President of the United States claim the media is bullying him. And I think this misuse of the term undermines the real impact and the everyday misery that the systematic misuse of power by one person over another brings. I have to say, President Officer, I think we may be in danger of trying to present all MSPs in here today as somehow unique and saintly people who would never, ever indulge in such practices. But I think if we all recall from the dark recesses of our minds some of the behaviour that we engaged in or had done to us in school, then we may reflect on that a bit more. Um, when I taught in school, I saw firsthand uh, in schools and colleges over the nine years I was there, pupils being singled out for being different. It could be for being gay, for coming from a different country, BME communities, for their gender, their beliefs, the clothes they wear, the football team they supported, how they looked or how they spoke, their disability, uh, their academic achievement or lack of academic achievement, even where they lived or their social class. And I heard some of the most appalling things said by one pupil or a group of pupils to another. Schools and classrooms can be a very cruel and lonely place, but they can also be the most inspiring, caring and compassionate places too. I saw the overwhelming majority of pupils show humanity and solidarity and decency, dignity and respect to their fellow pupils, especially in real, pupils in real need. And I saw pupils who had been aggressors develop into good, compassionate members of society because they need support, help and understanding too. Because we don't know often what is going on in their mind or in their backgrounds. A few years ago, I had the privilege to show a film in this parliament made by pupils from St. Kennedy Girls Academy in Blackburn. Uh, they made it along with UNICEF. It featured a young boy uh, called Timmy who when asked at a school assembly in front of the whole school whether anyone believed they were poor, he raised his hand in front of all his peers. But instead of being singled out for ridicule, this boy was supported. He was surrounded by people wanting to help in a school community looking after one of its own. His real story and the school's work won a UNICEF award and it was inspirational. But for a young person feeling increasingly alone and vulnerable, systematic bullying can have disastrous and lifelong consequences for their, their self-esteem, mental health, and many other parts of their life. In the past, of course, when the school gates uh, opened for home time, there would be res respite from the aggressor, but not now. Uh, the dominance of technology and social media provides the bully with a, a new toolkit and uh, a quarter of young people who contacted Childline reported online abuse. That means that misery continues long after the school bell rings. And of course, that impacts on their relationships, their families, attainment, uh, uh, mental health, and it can impact and damage them on them and damage them for life. I spoke to a constituent re recently, a friend of mine, uh, for many years used to be a neighbor, a man in his 50s, and he has a speech impediment. And he recalled how life at school for him was a misery, how he was relentlessly mocked and embarrassed, made to read aloud with others sniggering and mocking him, all because he had a stammer. And it has affected him all his life. It has affected his confidence, his self-belief, his social life in so many other areas. And none of us, none of us can really understand that unless we've experienced it ourselves. And of course, for girls and young women, we see the consequences of sexual harassment and pressure to share images of themselves. This can be devastating. The Sunday Herald recently reported that 43% of the over 10,000 sexual crimes reported in 2015-16 related to a victim under 18. That is a shocking figure. So we need to ensure 
there is equality and fairness for all our young people. And to do that, we have to have systems in place to fight back and not just rhetoric, but real action. Uh, the motion mentions PSE in schools, and I taught PSE uh, in a number of the schools I was in. And working with outside agencies like youth workers, charities, police, NHS, fire service, ex-offenders, pressure groups, on a whole range of issues uh, can uh, ensure that PSE is an engaging uh, part of school. But these and other topics must be taught in a non-patronising way. They've got to be real and they cannot and must not ever be tokenistic because young people can smell tokenism a million miles away. Can I say I support the thrust of the report? There are lots of questions and recommendations in it, and it will be, uh, all of us will be interested to see how we make progress on this very important issue. Thank you very much. I call Ross Gray to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Four minutes, Mr Gray, I think, by agreement. Yes, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Personal social education is an issue I've been raising since my first election, not here, but six years ago to the Scottish Youth Parliament. SYP have long made the case that PSE needs to change to reflect the experiences, the real experiences of young people. I was pleased that one of the first requests I made here, a committee inquiry into PSE, was agreed. Many of us were only too aware that PSE just isn't working, and the inquiries put that on the record. With hundreds of submissions from young people, parents, teachers, charities, the strength of feeling was clear. It's clear that PSE is often seen as an extra, something less important than assessed subjects. But whether it's mental health education, consent and relationships, or personal finances, you cannot argue that this essential knowledge should be relegated to a lower tier. We've heard only too clearly what happens when these areas are not covered. The committee heard that many, most young people in Scotland, are not taught about consent in sex and relationship education. It would be willfully ignorant to believe there's no link between this and the issues of rape culture, sexual harassment, and the deeply embedded misogyny in our society. This expression highlighted the appalling need for classes on consent at university level. This weekend, the Sunday Herald reported the experiences of young women at school. They cited how normalised words like slut, bitch, and whore are, how unwanted touching and groping, sexual assault was far more common than many would care to admit and how many who do highlight or resist such behaviour were accused of overreacting. Revamped sex and relationship education, starting with the prin principle of consent, will not end this on its own. Much can be drawn here from the Equalities Committee report on bullying, but to be in a situation where most young people in Scotland do not learn about consent just is not tenable. This isn't unique though. The Terence Higgins Trust found that 75% of young people across the UK had not learned about consent at school. We also heard of the impact where classes are not LGBTI inclusive. Almost every LGBTI young person suffers from school bullying. More than one in four have self-harmed or attempted suicide, and almost nine in 10 said that they did not receive an LGBT inclusive education at school. Who they are, their life was not covered. For young people who are confused and anxious, trying themselves to understand who they are, this is not good enough. I'm so glad to see progress being made as a result of the work carried out by LGBT Youth Scotland, Stonewall, and of course the Thai campaign, who've been tremendous advocates for LGBT inclusive education. The need for quality mental health education for every young person has also emerged strongly. The Youth Parliament found recently that three in four young people do not know what mental health information, support, and services are locally available. And the Church of Scotland's Youth Assembly declaring an interest as a member, uh, highlighted the need for PSE to tackle stigma around mental health, particularly the common use of stigmatising language. This will make a big difference in tackling the rising issue of young people's poor mental health. The Young Greens have recently launched a Healthy Minds campaign for a guarantee that every young person receives quality mental health education and that the transition from school to college or university is improved for young people receiving mental health support. And I hope the government will listen carefully to these calls. The range of issues which can and really must be delivered through PSE is considerable. In an era of exploitative work, our evidence showed the need for young people to learn about their rights and about key skills such as personal financial management. Now that 16 and 17 year olds have the vote, another win for the youth parliament, citizenship and democracy is a key subject. And we've heard wonderful examples from Bearsden Academy, again declaring an interest as a relatively recent former pupil, where the PSE curriculum is co-designed with pupils, featuring topics such as the sixth year holiday. In summary, while great work is going on, PSE is delivered inconsistency, inconsistently and with glaring omissions and dated practice in key areas of young people's lives. 
I'm delighted by the government's announced review, but refreshed guidance alone will not be enough. We need to be bold in ensuring that every young person receives the quality, inclusive personal and social education. Thank you very much. Deserve. Thank you. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Tom Mason. Ms McGuire, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to contribute to this important debate about the crucially interrelated issues of prejudice-based bullying and personal and social education in our schools. How we approach these topics will have a huge impact on the lives of children, the length and breadth of Scotland. It will profoundly influence the crucial and formative years that our children spend at school, shaping the lessons and experiences that will be carried into adulthood. In this, it will play a significant role in defining the type of adults and members of society that they will become. So the importance of these topics and the responsibility that lies with us to get this right can't be overstated. As such, I strongly welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to both refreshing the national approach to anti-bullying and to the national review of personal and social education. As a member of the Education and Skills Committee, I'll focus my comments today on PSE. As we've heard, the short investigation undertaken by the committee found that the sex and relationships education, inclusivity and diversity, mental health and drugs and alcohol misuse are the essential issues that young people tell us must feature in PSE. And the core values that have to underpin the teaching of these subjects can be summed up as respect, tolerance and consent. The concept of consent is of course particularly associated with sex and relationship education and I agree that consent is a hugely important issue and I'm very concerned that the committee's research found that it's not covered consistently within PSE at the moment. As a starting point we have to make absolutely sure that our children and young people fully understand and respect the notion of consent. However, I hope that people would agree that it should only be a starting point when it comes to discussing healthy and fulfilling sexual relationships. Consent, that is the absence of resistance, can only be a baseline, an absolute minimum standard and not the ultimate goal or the extent of our aspirations when it comes to the relationships of our young people. As we all know, healthy emotional, social and physical relationships are based on far more than just consent. They're based on enthusiastic and wholehearted commitment and participation, on mutual respect and confidence. So whilst I completely recognise and support the need to improve education around consent, I would also caution that we don't lose sight of the bigger picture and that we make sure that our younger people know that they should be aiming for far more than just the lack of resistance in their relationships with others. In a similar vein, during yesterday's statement on preventing sexual offending involving children and young people, I was pleased that the Cabinet Secretary agreed with me that the education received by children on the issue must focus on more than just what is lawful and unlawful, but also on what is healthy, safe and respectful. This is important because the review of personal and social education overlaps with many other key strategies and actions that are currently underway from anti-bullying to equally safe, the National Action Plan on Internet Safety for Children and Young People, and most recently the newly announced expert group on preventing sexual offending involving children and young people. In all of these areas, it's crucial that we distinguish between basic minimum standards of what's legal or acceptable behaviour and behaviour and relationships that are unambiguously positive, healthy, respectful and safe, and which we should be promoting as the ultimate goal for our younger people. As well as consent, another key issue identified by the committee when it comes to sex and relationships education was inclusivity. Our young people must have the right to see themselves and their families respectfully and honestly reflected in what they're taught in school. This valuing of diversity applies to the LGBT inclusive education and I reiterate my support at this point for the Thai campaign and the fantastic work that they're doing. But it's also about recognising and respecting that families come in all shapes and sizes, whether it's lone parent families, divorced parents, married parents, step families, blended families. Lastly, although the committee's report focused on PSE in the school context, the other point I would like to make is that it's really important to acknowledge that we can't give that full responsibility to schools and teachers. 
It's up to all of us to install and still values of tolerance and respect in our children and young people. The provision of quality and fit for purpose PSE is one part of the task, but it's also about what children and young people are learning at home and in their communities, what's happening in their families and in wider society. It's been heartening to hear um, a pretty agreeable debate this afternoon with lots of contributions from members who clearly care deeply about how um, our young people learn. And I look forward to working with everyone to make quality PSE and anti-bullying a success. May I have Tom Mason followed by David Torrance. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is somewhat of a poor reflection on our society that this topic needs to be discussed in the first place. However, we have a duty to acknowledge that where we can do better and work constructively to deliver for those affected. The necessity of ending the, of the prejudicial pre bullying in the highest point in Scotland schools is an area where all in this chamber undoubtedly agree. Our views differ on many things in Parliament, but this is certainly not one of them. I appreciate the constructive manner in which this has been approached by colleagues from across the polit polit political parties, but we do have a lot of work still to do. For example, Scotland Against Criminalisation Communities noted earlier this year that 55% of Muslim children experience verbal Islamophobia in school. And the Thai campaign reported that 91% of LGBT youth have experienced homophobia and related prejudice-based bullying. This is of this also causes huge teaching problems with more than 16,000 absences taking place due to bullying. As members are no doubt aware, there are numerous different reports and statistics I could cite and many have been put out today. But one in particular shocked me, presiding officer. The same study that from Thai found that 27 of LGBT youth have attempted to suicide at least once as a result of prejudicial bullying. That's 27%, that's a huge number. Young people feeling compelled to take their own lives due to the actions of others. This simply cannot be allowed to happen in a civilised society, so we must discuss solutions. The Education and Skills Committee report identified weaknesses in the delivery of personal and social education, and I cannot stress enough how important I believe this to be. When well done, PSE educates children and young people about healthy relationships, diversity and equality. Unfortunately, as the committee has found, only 9% of teachers felt the Scottish Government's PHSPE guidance was to be sufficient. That is without mentioning the fact that 34% hadn't even read it. We need to approach to PSE that is consistent across the country, that deals adequately with matters versus minority issues, diversity and mental health, with a focus on combating the attitudes that allow prejudice and hatred to prosper. Another key consideration is the ability of the teachers to deliver such content. The high specialised nature of secondary education means that often teachers do not have the relevant training to deal with these complex issues. So I can impress on the, ca so I can I impress on the Cabinet Secretary the need not just to improve what we teach as part of PSE and how we deliver it, but to ensure that the guidance given is salient for teachers across, across the country. Starting officer, there is another area that I have some reservation, and that is the review process for the national anti-bullying approach. I know that the Cabinet Secretary has committed to reviewing this every five years, with intermittent ad hoc evaluation in interim periods. I would urge him to look, look again. And I do so not just looking at where we might be in five years from now, but also the changes we have seen in the past years alone. I think the committee's recommendation to make a full review more regular is a sound one and should be considered to gain by the Scottish Government. In conclusion, presiding officer, I think we all appreciate the necessity and the gravity of the task ahead of us. To end bullying and harassment in our schools, we need to put in place educational practices to prevent this behaviour from surfacing, showing why it is unacceptable in the first place. The Scottish Government will publish this review in PSE by the end of next year as part of their mental health strategy. And whilst I look forward to seeing these recommendations, that that town should, should not prevent the Minister from taking swifter action when needed. I encourage all those who can make a difference to do just that, whether we are teachers, ministers, 
MSPs, community leaders, we all have a responsibility to do better. So let's work together and make prejudice-based bullying and harassment in schools a thing of the past. Thank you. I call David Torrance to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you, President Officer. Can I refer members to my register of interests? As a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I'd first like to thank the clerking teams for their hard work in compelling the findings of the Committee's fifth and seventh reports to highlight prejudice-based bullying and harassment in schools. And I welcome both reports' recommendations. I'd also like to take time to acknowledge the contributions from children and young people that shared their extremely moving stories with us. It was their stories that shared experiences that provided us the greatest insight into the extent and nature of prejudice bullying in our schools. I offer you my heartfelt thanks and I appreciate how difficult it was for many of you to share such personal experiences. When children and young people are continuously bullied because of their race, age, disability, gender or gender identity, religion or belief or sexual orientation, we are told to accept the negative identity that others give them. The policy recommendations that came out of these reports being discussed in this debate focus on changing attitudes and behaviour amongst young people and teaching staff. Young people should see all students and staff as treated with respect, as the quality of relationships and the ways in which pupils, staff and the wider community interact all provide vital indications of an inclusive educational experience. Policies and approaches need to adapt to the changing nature of technology and social media. While we provide a platform to voice our opinions, it can also ruin a child's life without a moment's hesitation. By the time we read 18 at school, we have spent 11,000 hours of our life in school. Our time in schools can have a great influence on our characters, our beliefs and our attitudes as we spend more time with our peers than with our parents. In order to promote a stronger anti-bullying policy, we need to understand that the voices of young people are first voices that should be heard. The committee had the pleasure of welcoming Cameron Bowie and Rector Derek Allen from Kirkcaldy High School to one of our meetings to discuss the challenges that young people face in my com community. Every school in Fife is required to develop and maintain their own anti-bullying policy, developed in conjunction with children and parents. Kirkcaldy High School continues to impress me in valuing the respect for others in the classroom as well as in formal school settings. The presence of young voices around the policy-making table is crucial for formulating anti-bullying legislation and we must continue to encourage students to voice their concerns with parents, teachers and their representatives. I believe Kirkcaldy High School to be a leading way in equality, acceptance and inclusivity in education with my constituency. This was recently echoed when the school was identified by Stonewall Scotland as a leading practice nationally and named as Stonewall's champion school. The extremely positive ethos at Kirkcaldy High School has been achieved by a reinforcement of a continuously strong and clear message from all staff and strong educational programme focusing on topics such as prejudice and stereotyping. The LGBT plus group at Kirkcaldy High School, which is made up of around 30 young people, has played a major role in attaining a positive culture that exists within the school. The group was formed in 2015 and has become an integral part of the school thanks to a highly visible presence both in and out of school. Following an invasion from an invitation from a director of Respect Me, the group recently gave a presentation at a national conference on bullying and discrimination. All too often, young people's voices are often drowned out. The amazing efforts of the pupils at Kirkcaldy High School prove that we are giving young voices the means of tackling bullying. They will have the power to shape bullying culture and give younger people a better experience at school. Bullying deteriorates confidence and therefore it is crucial that we help children fulfill their full potential. Recent studies have shown that bullying has a long-term impact long into their adult lives. Those who experience bullying as early, as early as four years old are much more likely to be physical, psychologically and mentally disadvantaged. Therefore, bullying isn't only a problem for our children, it becomes a problem for our adults too. As everyone is aware, I have a great passion for scouting. Scouting is a place for people to be themselves, welcoming all young people and adults regardless of their sexuality or gender identity. The committee recently heard evidence from a range of people from all around different backgrounds. The de evidence that affected me most on a very personal level was that from the Girl Guide in Scotland and the results of the research which included startling statistics that nearly two and three girls aged between 13 and 21 have experienced some form of harassment in school. It is therefore a priority to ensure that all young people feel they are able to thrive and feel safe in a supportive environment that celebrates differences 
inclusively ensures that LGBTQA plus community can access support. Scout Scotland has a national Scout Active Support Unit called FLAGS, which actively supports recruitment and support of LGBTQA plus adults within the Scout Association. Our Equal Opportunities Policy has covered LGBT rights for more than 20 years, and we do lots more to actively reach LGBTI community. We welcome LGBTI members at all levels into our organisation, appoint volunteer specialists in diversity, including LGBTI advisors, and have attended the Scottish Pride Festivals for the last five years. I continue to be impressed by evidence from some several, several youth organisations who have already recognised the importance and have implemented, implemented measures to address this issue and ensure inclusivity for all. In conclusion, presiding officer, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's response to the 29 recommendations and look forward to working with the Scottish Government to advance awareness to tackle prejudices, based bullying, as well as to continue to hear evidence sessions being shared across Scotland. We need to empower young students to feel part of the solution, not the problem. Policymakers, teachers, local authorities need to cooperate on anti-bullying policies alongside their students and work with them to come up with a solution. When young people participate, when it becomes their rules too, they will be more inclined to follow them. Schools are an excellent way to promote respecting and celebrating differences and diversity and to learn to stand up to bullying. We need to send a message to our young people you that they're powerful, close, that they can make a huge difference in changing their own lives and the future attitudes towards bullying in Scotland. The last of the open debate contributions is from Andy Whiteman. Two minutes has agreed. Please, Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you. Very shortly after being elected, I was approached by constituents with a case involving a child who was the victim of serious bullying that ended up causing lifelong injuries at George Watson's College uh, in Edinburgh. On 15 February 2017, a report of the annual HMI engagement visit to the school reported that, were, they, that there were, and I quote, no identified areas for development in relation to safeguarding. Yet by this time, the school was aware of a catalogue of complaints of various forms of bullying against a pupil and knew that its parent liaison group had heard of bullying concerns by parents who were scared to complain. The school was also aware of potential regulatory action under consideration then by Scottish ministers. In September this year, a special inspection was conducted, and three weeks ago, Scottish ministers wrote to the Merchant Company of Edinburgh to inform it that, and I quote, the Scottish ministers are satisfied that George Watson's College is at risk of becoming objectionable on the following ground, that the welfare of a pupil attending the school is not adequately safeguarded and promoted there. Presiding officer, I do not know whether the governance failures identified at George Watson's College are an isolated incident within the Merchant Company of Edinburgh Schools or within private schools more generally, but we need to find out as a matter of urgency. The EHR committee makes a number of recommendations in its report. Recommendation 20 and 28 are of particular relevance, yet neither recommendation nor the government's response to them suggests that these will apply equally to the private sector. And I'd be particularly pleased to hear from the Cabinet Secretary his view on whether in particular monitoring and recording should apply to all schools. Anti-bullying measures, whether statutory or in the form of guidance, should apply equally to all schools, including private schools, as children's human rights are universal and indivisible. It's self-evident that the welfare of children at this school is at risk Yet the letter intimating regulatory action and the HMI report have not been published. I plan to publish both documents this afternoon and would invite ministers to reflect on the possibility that there are wider governance and safeguarding failings in the private sector and to investigate whether this is or is not the case as a matter of utmost urgency. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Mary Fee up to six minutes, please, Ms Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I'm extremely grateful to have the opportunity to speak in this debate today. Can I start by thanking my fellow members of the committee and the committee clerks, who, as always, were of tremendous assistance in helping to publish the report into prejudice-based <laughs> bullying and harassment of children and young people in schools. The inquiry by the committee was extensive and comprehensive, taking evidence from a wide range of witnesses, including academics and third sector organisations. However, undoubtedly, the most compelling voices were those of the young people who spoke candidly of their experiences of bullying and, and harassment in schools. 
And, Presiding Officer, this debate has been consensual in nature, with all parties across the Chamber expressing a clear commitment to eradicate prejudice-based bullying and harassment of young people in school. And in closing the debate today, on behalf of Scottish Labour, I want to reflect on the key themes of this afternoon's debate and consider some of the particularly thoughtful contributions from colleagues across the Chamber. However, before doing so, I'd like to briefly touch on the pertinent issue of LGBTI bullying in schools, about which the committee heard quite harrowing evidence from a range of, of young people. And recent evidence from Stonewall Scotland has revealed the continuing high prevalence of LGBTI I bullying in schools, an area that was highlighted earlier by Monica Lennon and also by other speakers. And in giving evidence to the committee, LGBT Youth Scotland revealed that many of the young people who use their support services have experienced intrusive suicidal thoughts as a result of the bullying they have experienced in school. For too long, we have accepted bullying as just banter or part of the natural order of the transition from childhood to adulthood. Bullying is an extremely serious issue which can cause long-term damage to an individual's mental health. We have a responsibility to ensure that every young person, no matter their sexual or gender identity, has the right to a safe and enjoyable education without fear of bullying or harassment. LGBTI bullying in schools is not restricted to a certain group of schools, a specific region of the country, it's present in schools in every village, town and city across the length and breadth of Scotland. However, things don't have to be this way. Kirkcaldy High School, as mentioned by David Torrance, provides a shining example of how schools can take the initiative to tackle LGBTI bullying. The ethos of Kirk Kirkcaldy High School is to actively promote diversity and inclusivity. The school works tirelessly to eradicate LGBTI bullying with the establishment of a student-led LGBTI committee which has helped to ensure that their students feel safe, secure and valued regardless of their gender or sexual orientation. And I know that I speak for all members of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee in saying that we were extremely impressed by the approach taken by Kirkcaldy High School all of their staff and pupils should be incredibly proud of what they have achieved. And in the time remaining, presiding officer, I'd like to reflect on the key themes of this afternoon's debate. We have heard considered and thoughtful speeches from across the chamber, and there has rightly been a focus placed on improving the recording and monitoring of bullying and harassment in schools. There's been a focus put on the discussion around how to improve support services, available in schools to give the appropriate guidance and counselling to young people who have been bullied or harassed. The importance of PSE was highlighted by several speakers. And James Dornan's contribution covering his committee's work was particularly helpful. And I am grateful to the Education Committee for their ongoing focus on this issue. In the time remaining, I, I don't have to uh, the I don't have the time to go through every individual contribution made to the debate. However, I'd like to specifically mention the contributions from Gail Ross and Neil Finlay, which I think were particularly powerful. And in addition, the important issue of mental health was touched upon by Daniel Johnson and, and Claire Hawkey. And, presiding officer, in, in closing, I look to once again thank all members who have contributed thoughtfully and constructively to this vitally important debate today. And most importantly, I'd like to once again take the opportunity to thank all of the young people who gave evidence to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Without the bravery, honesty and openness of these young people, we would not be aware of the true scale of prejudice-based bullying and harassment still experienced by thousands of children in Scotland each and every day. We as a parliament must do more to promote inclusivity in schools but local authorities and individual schools must also take greater responsibility to eradicate prejudice-based bullying and harassment. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, it's disappointing to note that not all of those who took part in the debate are in the chamber for the closing speeches. And could I also remind all members that if they have taken part in the debate, they should be in for the start of the closing speeches. It's discourteous to the Chamber to do otherwise. And I call Jamie Green. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
Alex Cole Hamilton opened proceedings today outlining the context of the debate. It is National Anti-Bullying Week and also there are a number of national conversations around our behaviour towards one another across all walks of life. Today's debate makes it abundantly clear that we can't just tackle bullying as it happens, we must stop it happening in the first place. Therefore, preventative education is the key. And I have to say today's debate has been quite depressing in many ways. Story after story, from every corner of Scotland, so many young people suffering on a daily basis. Now, admittedly, we do live in a far more inclusive society than ever before in terms of gender, sexuality, race, religion, and disability. But underneath this, there still remains an undercurrent of discrimination. Uh, one of the most startling figures uh, to come out of the debate was uh, from Stonewall Scotland that said that 90% of LGBT people have experienced homophobia, biphobia, or transphobia at school. At school, not in the street or on a bus, but in school, the very place that we expect our children to learn and develop from childhood into adulthood. Nearly half of LGBT students are routinely bullied. So how on earth can we uh, expect that to be an environment where children can learn, develop, or grow? Now, the warm words and commitments made by the government today are very welcome from these benches, but for some, it will be too little too late. I must agree with my colleague, uh, Michelle Ballantyne, who said in her uh, opening comments that a one size uh, does not fit all when it comes to tackling bullying. The methods have changed, and therefore how we tackle it must be flexible and nimble too. It is evidently clear that education at the earliest age appropriate is the way we tackle intolerance in society. And we will have to tackle sensitive and often challenging issues with our children. Of course, the education must be age appropriate, but we must also accept that today's world is a digital one. And that the byproduct of that is that access to adult themes uh, from a younger age uh, is much more prevalent than was the, in the, uh, was the case in our childhood. I'd like to come to some of the excellent contributions made today from right across the chamber. Uh, first of all, Jeremy Balfour pointed out that disability can come in many forms, both physical, but also unseen and mental. He raised some salient points around the need for improvements in teacher training. Now, high, te high school teachers are specialists, but they're not always specialists in PSE. Our teachers really need the support of externally trained experts and along with consistent teacher training mechanisms to allow them to deliver PSE uh, adequately. Mr. Balfour also touched, I think, on the often overlooked point of faith-based harassment. And where this still exists, it must be stamped out. And this is especially important, uh, important where we see sectarianism in sport. Uh, the language, the imagery, and the chants really haven't changed very much at all since the days of my educational segregation. It is a blight on our society. Uh, following on from Monica, Lennon, uh, Monica Lennon's very sad story about a transgender constituent suffering at the hands of daily harassment, and at the risk of repeating ourselves too much, may also pay tribute uh, to uh, uh, my friends in the Thai campaign for their cross-party efforts in tackling this. And like other, many other third uh, sector charities, they work in schools talking to teachers and pupils directly. They are confronting prejudice at the cold face. I have signed their pledge and I encourage others to do the same. Uh, Tom Mason uh, rightly emphasized the need for a coherent strategy across the country so that uh, there can be a clear understanding of what needs to be covered in the classroom. I was also particularly struck by my colleague uh, Brian Whittle's participation. Uh, he had a very positive story to share. Uh, uh, he gave the example of uh, we bod big heed to I shall be looking up on Facebook later. But he shows an example of what can be achieved when we get things right, when we often speak of what happens when we don't. Uh, Daniel Johnson in his contribution was very right to point out the important issue of the waiting times for mental health support for young people in Scotland. And he's very right to do so. Waiting months for specialist help is a dire outcome. Uh, Gail Ross, I think, made a very uh, thought-provoking speech today. Uh, bullying isn't a word. It is an action. And right now, there is someone sitting at home who has just returned from another day at school and probably another day of hell. And guess what? The bullying has probably followed them home. 
and it's probably due to social media. And moreover, presiding officer, and this should bother us as MSPs, is that some of these people tried to seek help and found no solace. So in closing, I would like the government benches to consider some of our proposals to improve PSE. Let's ensure that PSE is adequately delivered in every school across all of Scotland. It is absolutely remarkable that this is not currently the case. Let us train teachers on how to deliver this subject. Let us enshrine LGBTI subjects in PSE and train teachers how to deliver it. Let us standardise the teaching framework so there is consistency in Scotland. And let us be open-minded as to the content of PSE so that it scopes way beyond just sex, drugs and the internet and looks at all walks of life, including personal finance and citizenship. Let's really make speedy progress with the introdu introduction of uh, bullying uh, monitoring and metrics. We can no longer accept the response that it's someone else's job to do that. When we speak in the political arena about getting it right for every child, I have to say the stories shared in today's debate make it clear that this still remains an ambition rather than an achievement. Thank you. I call on John Swinney. Up to seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Officer, this has been a valuable and thoughtful debate where we've had the opportunity to reflect on two important reports from two parliamentary committees which have drawn together a considerable amount of evidence and feedback from members of the public, um, an awful lot of which uh, given with great courage and provided with great courage by members of the public who endure examples of bullying behaviour and who are living with the consequences. And I put on record my admiration and the government's admiration for individuals who've come forward to contribute to our discussions in that fashion. A number of the contributions in the discussion today have reflected on some of that evidence and I was struck by the contrast within Monica Lennon's contribution between one very bad example of uh, a young person and the very good example of, that she raised about Brannock High School. And I suppose, the, the, and it's also related to the contribution that Mr Whittle made, where he talked about the example of one young man who uh, prospered within a mainstream educational uh, situation despite the uh, challenges that he was facing. But the fundamentally strong theme that ran through both of those contributions from Mr Whittle and Monica Lennon was about the strength of the ethos of the schools in concern. That Brannock High School that uh, Monica Lennon cited, I'm not sure if I recall the school that Mr uh, Whittle was referring to, but what was fundamentally at the heart of ensuring those young people had a good experience was the ethos of the school and the inclusivity of the school. And that is essentially what lies at the heart of the government's thinking around the respect for all guidance that has been issued, that we are setting out to our school system, but also to the wider debate in Scotland, some of the important elements that must be at the heart of the approach to education that we take forward to ensure that there is the strongest possible ethos that gives support and assistance to young people because that will be a valuable part in the journey of supporting young people to avoid them developing further mental health challenges which will require more acute interventions, which clearly I acknowledge and ministers have acknowledged um, these services are under significant pressure. But if there is a strong ethos in the school, that can assist in equipping young people with the ability to avoid having to seek further assistance because their condition has not deteriorated to merit such intervention. Of course, the challenge of this whole area of, of policy, which has been with us for all time, is made more demanding by the era in which we live, in which uh, cyberbullying is a, a significant factor in life, and it can follow young people out of an educational setting into a home setting where young people may be able to experience um, much greater support. So the importance of ensuring that uh, our policy approach adequately equips young people with the resilience to be able to withstand the pressures that may come from cyberbullying, but also given the confidence to tackle that unacceptable behaviour and to be clear that that behaviour is unacceptable is an important part of the agenda that we take forward. 
And it also, because of the importance of the home setting, brings into play the points made by Ruth Maguire, by Tom Mason and Jeremy Balfour about the importance of parental involvement in ensuring that parents are equipped with knowledge in which they can support young people um, should their uh, children be experiencing some of these difficulties and be able to support them to acquire the resilience to tackle many of these questions. Um, one of the points that Mr Matheson announced in the statement that was given to Parliament yesterday on, as part of the expert group on preventing sexual offending involving children and young people was the importance of uh, tackling early, and, uh, early these examples and creating the resilience within young people to ensure that they can withstand these issues, which was, uh, addresses one of the points made by my colleague Gail Ross in a very powerful contribution to the debate this afternoon. I said in my opening remarks that I would spend a little bit of time on personal and social education, which I intend to do, because the review of personal and social education is an important aspect of ensuring that there is proactive support and assistance within our schools uh, to assist young people. That personal social education must be appropriate for the times, it must be relevant, and in that respect, the point that Mr Greer made in the uh, debate, which is a point he's made before to me, and one that I happily um, a, a respond to, is that the issue of consent and the development of a deeper understanding of the issue of consent uh, must be central to the approach that we take forward on personal and social education. There has been a, a, a call in Parliament today for that personal and social education to be delivered, I, I think I'd characterise it in a uniform fashion across the country. Um, I think that inhibits, whilst I want to make sure that personal and social education is valuable and relevant to every young person across the country, I think that approach inhibits the professional responsibility of individual teachers to decide what is the correct approach to be taken in certain circumstances around the country. And I don't want to in any way impede on that professional capacity of teachers to make the judgment about the most effective way in which they can deliver personal and social education. Let me close, presiding officer, by reflecting on the contribution of the convener of the Education Committee, James Dornan, who talked about a number of values that must underpin the approach that we take in all of these areas of policy, whether it's about the way we tackle bullying in our society or whether it's about how we equip our young people with the capacities to handle uh, some of these challenging issues that, uh, with which we wrestle in personal and social education. And Mr Donnan talked about the importance of the understanding of consent, of love, of kindness and of respect at the heart of this agenda. And I think it is important in this parliamentary debate that we reflect on those values and understand the significance they can have in ensuring that we have an approach in this area of policy, supported by very broad consensus within Parliament that can have a profound impact on the lives of young people and equip them with all that they require to withstand the, uh, the pressures that come from, uh, from bullying, but also have the ability to be well educated through personal and social education to meet the challenges of our times, as we intend that to be the content, content of the review that we undertake. I call Johan Lamont on behalf of the Education Skills Committee. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms Lamont. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I declare an interest um, as a member of the EIS and a, a former school teacher? Um, it's a great privilege for me to close on behalf of the Education and Skills Committee. And can I thank all of those who gave us briefings for this debate today and for all the work done by the two uh, committees and clerks in informing this debate and I hope informing the work taken forward. I suppose as a school teacher, one of the things I used to worry about most was bullying and the message I used to give to young people, you have to speak up, tell us and I'll promise you you'll be okay. And I realised it was a promise actually it was very difficult to keep. And it is because it can be insidious. It is because it's not just within the classroom. It can seep out into the community, and it did 20 years ago, seep out into the community where a young person could be targeted and feel absolutely destroyed. And I knew young people whose life chances, their capacity to learn in school was utterly diminished by their experience um, of bullying. But also would like to give a thought for the bullies I taught youngsters with bullies. As parents, we often worry that our children might be bullied. We never think 
that they might be bullies. And I think there is work to be done to understand what takes people to that place and the collective experience of those round about. One thing I used to teach my children, it's bad enough to be bullied, but if you see somebody else being bullied, that is a greater responsibility to speak out and to speak up for them. And I think it is an issue that people live with right out up into adult life. But of course, it is also true that bullying is not without its social context. Do we think about how as a society we treat people with disabilities and then be surprised if that's reflected in our schools, the way we treat people of a different culture, a different background, and even the way here that we treat each other in our political discourse, whether that does give people messages about what is acceptable behaviour. And I think there are important issues highlight highlighted in this report on personal and social education, and I want to talk about some of these. There are so many issues facing young people today. Pressures on their personal lives, pressures to do well at school and their future opportunities and achieving, the financial pressures that they may experience, the experience of precarious work that I never knew, but I know is all too much the experience of young people who may be bullied in their workplace when they're trying to do their best to earn a bit of money to keep them going. And all of that in a brutally harsh, judgmental world of social media. It is clear that it's unrealistic to think that personal social education can do all of that, can sort all of that for us. I know in my own uh, working life, St Andrews, First Aid, um, British Health Heart Foundation, one dear to my heart, remembering Srebrenica Scotland, all want to get into schools, want to go in and work with PSE teachers. There are so many people who see the opportunity that school affords to get these messages out. We know that it's not possible for personal social education to do all of that. But what is done should be done well, should not be a time filler. And of course, education is not necessarily the simple cause of discrimination, but it must not compound the problems that young people already face. And as has been said, we do commend the campaigns of Ty and others in talking about the direct experience and the way in which school did make things worse. And there's been some discussion about consent, and I see a role for PSE in addressing these questions, but we ought not to get away with the idea. We had evidence from somebody who said they got to university and didn't know about consent. Frankly, I sometimes think that is a bit of a get-out clause for people who understand exactly how they're behaving and how inappropriate it is. And it is important to talk about consent, but it's also important to talk about personal responsibility. When I was still teaching 20 years ago, Castle Milk High School did, had such forward-thinking, pioneering around the role of personal and social education. It was driven by the guidance department, but with other volunteers participating. It was done in small groups. It was done with external visitors, and it was done in a co-productive way with the young people themselves. I have to ask the question, is that model, which was so effective, realistic in this day, with pressures on staffing and pressures on support staff? It's essential, I think, um, that in terms of education, it's not just that personal social education, not a bonus, not an add-on, but can be central to a young person's ability to learn. And it's why we emphasise again that education is not just about buildings and about teachers, but it is about all the other supports in the school that allow a good PSE programme to develop. In our report, there's an emphasis on a number of things. On the question, we do believe that relationship education, the question of consent, yes, about sex, but more about respect and how people can um, respect each other, it should be core to it. It should be understand diversity within the classroom, that people will come with different experiences, and it should be inclusive of all those experiences, not describing some as other, as something that's not to do with the school. It should be talking about mental health issues, not to medicalise the problems for young people, but to understand trauma, secrecy, what young people may be living with in their lives and try to get other young people to understand and empathise with that. That perhaps a young person's attendance on behaviour is not evidence of a problematic young person, but that young people are responding logically to their own experience. And the more conversations there are within schools about that experience of all too many young people is really important. There are a number of concerns um, highlighted within the report, particularly about the patchy provision, and I hear what the Cabinet Secretary said. We may not want uniformity, but I think there's a reasonable expectation of consistency. 
We welcome the review and it should emphasise the importance of health and equalities. The way in which the curriculum is operated, it should be seen as a core part of that. And there are important questions raised. Should uh, personal social education be mandatory? A lot of the organisations working with young people said it should be and should be consistent and there should be direction from the centre. This is something I think that we have to uh, wrestle with. It has to be balanced with other curriculum areas and the pressures that schools face. But I repeat again, the reality is for some young people will not access the curriculum, will not achieve unless they get the kinds of support that effective personal and social education can give. This is also an opportunity, I think, to acknowledge those people who have spoken out about their experience of bullying in school and elsewhere. We commend the, the Thai campaign, but those other groups who also understand just how insidious and uh, destroying being bullied can be. And if I just say in the by going, the Thai campaign, just to attach myself to its success a little, we should note that it started life as a petition to the Public Petitions Committee. And I hope that other campaigns will see that as an important way of bringing to attention the Parliament the work that they want to do. I think there is a question... You must to, close, Ms Lamont. Just in conclusion, that we recognise that personal social education should be in the context of the broader ethos of the school. It is the whole school's responsibility and within schools and across schools, are all of our responsibility to address bullying wherever it is seen. I call Annie Wells to uh, close the debate on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Hearing speakers from across the chamber uh, come together on such an important issue is very welcomed by the committee. And I am pleased to have the opportunity to close for the Equalities and Human Rights Committee today. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the many, mem the many um, organisations and individuals who gave evidence to both committees and the hard work of the clerks and also give my thanks to the Education and Skills Committee for their contribution. I have spoken in this chamber before on my own experience of being bullied in school and although I won't go into the detail again, what I think is really telling is that 30 years later this is still happening in our schools. There isn't a magic ingredient, we know that, but there are ways and means by which we can drastically go about improving the situation. Perhaps instrumental to this, and as we have seen today, is that we work together in what is essentially a public health issue. And I am pleased that the Scottish Government worked with the committee by halting the publication of its anti-bullying strategy and for also taking into serious consideration the recommendations made uh, in the committee's report and I welcome the introduction of the working group to look at the process of uniformed mandatory monitoring system. During the, the debate, we heard from my fellow committee members, Alex Cole Hamilton and Gail Ross, talk about the right training for teachers in tackling prejudice-based prejudice bullying, as did many others speak in the debate today. Also that consent, healthy relationships and human rights be taught from the earliest stage possible. Gail Ross also spoke about Section 28 and that all teachers need to be made fully aware that that no longer exists. David Torrance mentioned Kirkcaldy High School and its anti-bullying strategy. And during an evidence session with Kirkcaldy High School, they shared with the committee how they are leading the way in equality and inclusivity. And as David mentioned, winning Stonewall Scotland's Champion School Award. Mary Fee and Jamie Green spoke of LGBTI bullying and the shocking figures of those who have been bullied and, more shockingly, of those who had thought of taking their own lives. What I'd like to focus on today, however, as I close the debate for the committee, is just why it's so important to get this right. As has been touched upon by many, including the Scottish Youth Parliament and its Right Here, Right Now campaign, bullying is a human rights issue. The repercussions we all know go far beyond the school gates and well beyond your time spent as children and teenagers. During the evidence sessions as part of the inquiry, we heard from a number of witnesses who shared some very harrowing stories of their experiences in school. One of the most distressing cases we encountered was that of Rebecca Nicholson, a young woman from the Highlands who now volunteers as a disabled youth worker with Inclusion Scotland. As a wheelchair user in secondary school, Rebecca's life was made miserable by fellow students. 
She faced verbal abuse. Pupils would put rubbish in the hood of her clothing. And when she sought help from the teachers and school leadership, this behaviour was brushed under the carpet and rationalised, something simply to ignore. Rebecca changed schools twice. She felt, she felt isolated. She was made to feel an inconvenience to teachers and she eventually became depressed. These issues didn't stop the moment she left school, the consequences of which were Rebecca entering into an abusive relationship in her early adulthood and subsequently being diagnosed with post-traumatic disorder. Although Rebecca is now doing well, studying health and social care at university and working tirelessly to eliminate disability-based prejudice in schools, this anecdote for which we are indebted to Rebecca for sharing really highlights the de devastating effects bullying can have on someone's life. There is a bigger picture to this and one that arguably makes bullying a public health issue. In politics right now, we talk constantly about mental health and rightly so. In light of recent events, we are now also talking about sexual harassment. These issues are not devoid of, of a relationship with the goings on of our time spent at school. Statistically, we know that 20% of adolescents may experience a mental health problem in any given year. And we know that 50% of mental health problems are established by the age of 14. I don't for one minute think that mental health problems stem from issues at school, absolutely not. But we must recognise the need to garner an environment which protects young people from exacerbating the problem. Just this weekend, we saw more media coverage of sexual harassment in schools, with girls being subject to shocking levels of sexual harassment on a daily basis, including catcalling and the casual use of words like slut, whore and bitch, unwanted touching, boys watching violent porn at school, problems with sexting where intimate pictures of girls are shared through social media. And recent research by Girl Guiding found that nearly two in three girls aged between 13 and 21 have experienced some form of sexual harassment in school. And at this point, I would like to make, I, the next point I would like to make is how many of the behaviours we are now really beginning to call out in adult world are starting at school as young people. How many behaviours can we prevent from spilling into our adult lives? And that's what this should be about, prevention, looking at the wider societal impact bullying has on our mental health on our and our values relating to how we treat one another. We don't always know where things are going, going to go. Even 10 years ago, no one would have predicted the potential impact of social media in our schools as a tool for sexual harassment. No one had predicted the recent fallout from the Harvey Weinstein scandal. That's why it's so important that we work together to get ahead of these issues and precipitate the possible longer term wider effects. Only by taking decisive action at an early stage can we begin to get to the root of these issues and continue to make progress. That's the change in attitudes I have spoken about today and one that I hope is taken forward by all members on all sides. That's why I welcome the consensus across the chamber in today's debate and the positive contribu contributions made by members. Let this parliament today send out the message, it's not cool to be cruel. Thank you. That concludes the debate on prejudice-based bullying and harassment of children and young people in schools and review of personal and social education. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion 8862 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button. No one has pressed the request to speak button. I therefore call on Maurice Golden on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move motion 8862. Formally moved. As no member has asked to speak against the motion. The question is that motion 8862 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. Can you... Wait until decision time is complete, please. Thank you. I, I recognise that you did it before decision time, uh, but I would prefer it if you waited until we're closed. Uh, there's a single question to be put as a result of today's business. 
Uh, the question is that motion 8171 in the name of Christina McKelvey on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee on prejudice-based bullying and harassment of children and young people in schools and review of personal and social education be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time. Mr Harvey. Uh, I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. Uh, as you'll be aware, the Finance and Constitution Committee is currently taking evidence in relation to the EU withdrawal bill and the question of legislative uh, consent for that bill. Uh, this morning, as part of that evidence taking, we heard one academic witness raise an argument which calls into question one of the functions of the presiding officer. Uh, as you'll be aware, the presiding officer under Rule 9.3 uh, is required to uh, give a, a ruling uh, which accompanies any, the introduction of any bill to this parliament uh, on the question of legislative, cons uh, legislative competence uh, of any bill being uh, considered by the parliament. The EU withdrawal bill, uh, if it was passed in its current form, introduces a new concept of law called EU retained law and would inhibit the ability of this parliament to pass legislation that wasn't compliant with this new body called EU retained law. Can I ask what consideration has been given by the presiding officer uh, and what advice has been taken by the presiding officer in relation to this aspect, which may impinge on the presiding officer's function in relation to legislative competence uh, and whether in fact that has been discussed uh, with the UK government in its drafting uh, of the EU withdrawal bill? Will it have an impact on, for example, the resources that presiding officer needs or the time that would be taken to ensure the legislative competence of any future bill uh, after the EU withdrawal bill has been passed. I'd like to thank Mr Harvey first of all for giving um, formal notice and formal notice of the point he has read, raised and I'd like to assure uh, Mr Harvey and indeed the chamber that these matters are under consideration. Uh, the presiding officer's role is in legislative competence, and that will continue. However, uh, retained EU law does indeed introduce a new concept. It will be up to the presiding officer to take that into account, along with all other considerations. And further, can I assure Mr Harvey that um, there is a careful watch being kept on all developments that are happening constitutionally, of course, and all these matters will be considered on an ongoing manner. We now move on to members' business, and I would um, ask, please, that members leave the chamber quickly and quietly.